Welcome back to the show, everyone. I am joined by my friend, Matt Eland. How are you today, Matt? I'm doing very good. It's Did nice I say to be your last here. Name wrong again? No, you got it. You got it. Uh, Matt, right. Matt Eland. All right. <laughs> yeah. I, I hate saying people's names wrong. And there are some names where I will just say it. I will say it over and over and over and over again. And then I'll have it right. And then the moment comes, and I screw it up. And I know I screwed it up because my brain cannot think straight. The famous example I use, I, so I have a friend. And I know this is way off topic. We, we haven't even started yet. I'm already off topic. You're uh, okay. I have a friend. Her name is Leanna. And she introduced herself as Leanna rhymes with banana. And I, I'm like, cool, I got that. But my kids watch Minions all the time. And banana. it's never, yeah, it's never banana. It's banana. Yeah. Like, banana. And so I had banana in my head. So I called her Liana. And she's like, that's not my name. I'm like, you're saying, oh. I'm like, but you said it's Liana like banana. And she's like, that's not how you say banana. That's how I so now every time I talk to her, I have this mental like tick she goes banana. And I don't. Anymore. It's great. We're back on topic. I'm actually not going to edit that out. Like that stays in the podcast because it's such a good story. Matt, I am so happy you're here with us today. Uh, I'm having a good time, Kevin. It, it's all about having fun. It's a late night on what Tuesday and it's Thanksgiving week. So hopefully everyone in the U S has a good, good holiday. This is going to come out after the holiday. So everyone's either dead or still surviving or eating Turkey sandwiches for the fifth day in a row. Um, well, let's, let's hope they're alive. Let's hope they're alive. Yeah. I mean, some, some folks go real hard on the Turkey. <laughs> All right. Back to the, Matt. Stop getting me off topic, man. <laughs> That's enough. Matt, tell us just real quick, a little bit about yourself. Where are you currently working? I am an AI specialist at Leading Edge. That's E-D-J-E, named it for our founders, up in uh, Dublin, Ohio. Um, so I am a, a software engineering and data science consultant. I get to work with various clients and uh, just help invest in technology in their organizations and other consultants as well. And that's a lot of fun. So I'm helping to develop our AI practices and uh, honestly having a blast. I I think it's fascinating. So I don't specialize at all in AI. I, like I know what AI is and I use what chat GPT, like every other developer more times than I should in a given day. What's it kind of look like from, so you say AI specialist, so you're going into to businesses and helping with AI architecture and solutions without getting the specifics. How are people sure. kind of generally, you know, taking advantage of AI in, I'm assuming business systems or is it more specialized than that? Well, a lot of what we do is applications development, web application development in particular, but we do mobile apps as well. Uh, a lot of people are curious about AI and, and what they can do, particularly with generative AI or gen AI with the, the new large language models that um, got five years old, but really took off last year with ChatGPT. Uh, so a lot of that is just helping people to understand, hey, here's how you use this. Here's the limitations of this. Here's how you improve the performance of it. Here's how you use it with your own data. Here's how you make sure it's not abused, that kind of thing. Um, but I, I like to joke that, you know, I'm an AI specialist, but AI is really everything. It's it's such a broad field. So it's sort of like saying I'm an everything specialist. Yeah. Um, a, lot, a lot of what I do with my learning is I, I learn to generalize. I learn all these different fields so I can drill into whatever you know, we need uh, for a client that we're working with or potentially working with. I always think that's the hardest question to uh, answer is I, like even our own applications, we have so much data and we look at it and go, all right, is there a, is there an AI solution here that we're just not seeing? And I, I just don't have the time to dive in and learn what I need to learn what I don't know, I, I think is the big thing. So like we have a lot of data. We know how our data works and we think we know what like AI solutions would apply there. But I think it's the bottom of the, what the bell curve of, of expertise. Like I, 
I don't know anything, but I know I don't know anything. And That's I need to give them that superpower where I think I know it all. Get that bell curve of, uh, you know, I know I know nothing. And then in the middle, yeah. you think you know everything. And then right, it's like, no, no, no. We're just keeping things super simple. We know all the ways this can break. You know, and that whole software engineering journey, it applies to data science as well. Well, that's uh, fascinating, but that's not the only thing you do. Um, we wanted to talk to you today because you're currently getting ready to launch a new book. Uh, you mm -hmm. want to tell us a little bit about the book you're getting ready to launch? So I think by the time that you all listen to this, the book will have launched because uh, it it, uh, it uh, releases this uh, Thursday, the uh, or sorry, Friday, the 24th, Black Friday uh, of November. Uh, so this is a uh, refactoring with C Sharp. This is my first technical book that's uh, been published. I'm really excited about it. And uh, yeah, the book really serves two audiences. Uh, the first is you know your your early intermediate .NET developers who are are looking to get better at their craft, looking to see how they can improve. Uh, and then the other person that serves is you know uh, that kind of that manager, that senior developer, that lead engineer who's saddled with a a, a lot of, of legacy de uh, code and technical debt. And they're trying to figure out how do I safely untangle myself from this mess? Yeah. Uh, so the, the book aims at serving both of those, those people uh, with varying chapters in a, in a journey. Um, but it's, uh, I'm really excited about it. I'm very proud of it. I had a lot of help from uh, folks in the, in the uh, tech community, particularly in Ohio, with my, uh, my fellow uh, technical reviewers. So I'm, I'm very thankful for them. Always think it's fascinating with the book that uh, I, feel like so i've never written a book but i've done courses and stuff but you have this i feel like every author kind of goes through this moment of imposter syndrome of like oh do i know enough about a subject to really write an entire book on it and books are so so permanent mm -hmm. <laughs> I, if i make a mistake on a course i can just go back and fix the course but if, like a book you kind of have to know what you're doing at the beginning can we talk a little bit about the the origin of the idea for the book was sure. that yours were you approached by a publisher how did refactoring in c sharp uh, come up as an idea so uh this this spring um packed publishing approached me and says hey hey matt i found this blog post you wrote last fall on dot editor config files in visual studio and recommendations for developers and i know you're doing a lot of ai stuff but you know you're teaching dot net professionally is, is there any chance that you'd be willing to write this book and my initial reaction was well you've approached me about other books but i i, I think this one kind of overlaps well with my skills it feels like this is an area there wouldn't be a gap in it feels like somebody else would have written about this and they had to kind of convince me that well, there actually was a, a sizable gap in time for people writing a this particular thing uh for a c-sharp audience and i i, I verified that and um it seemed like, uh, almost to go against your statement about imposter syndrome er earlier, yeah. it, it seemed like something I could do pretty easily. Um, just because a lot of it's thing, you know, things related to the journey I've gone on through my, my professional career and things that I've had to struggle through and wisdom I could share with other people. Um, once I got into the, once I got into the outline, I'm like, oh, well, it'd be really neat if we included a chapter on uh, uh, a GitHub Copilot chat. Uh, and uh, uh, Rosalind analyzers and how to build one and all, all the you know a few things I didn't know how to do at the time. Uh, and then when it came to write those things, that's that's when the imposter syndrome set. But it gives you a good opportunity to learn that stuff. You're at the top of that bell curve, right? You know what you don't know, mm -hmm. and, but you know it's a potential solution that would be good for the book. I, I'm fascinated with the process of writing a book. So as a person who's never written a book, uh, we had a previous guest, uh, Alvin Ashcraft, talked about writing his book, and I. I think uh, his journey was somewhat similar to yours. He, a uh, publisher found him and asked him to come in on a topic. Um, so let's start with just the outline. So was the outline just all you, just writing down all your thoughts and ideas? Did you go out and look for other material? Uh, did you ask, did the publisher have any input on that? When you're talking to a publisher, you're talking to an acquisitions editor. Um, well, if you get past the front gates, you're talking to the acquisitions editor and that person usually has an idea of what they want to publish in the coming period of time for them. Um, this was something that they had not identified that they wanted, to do, but they still needed a formal proposal so that they could review it with their internal processes. 
So that means that you need to write out who's the audience for, uh, you know, who are you? Why should you be the one to write the book? Um, what are people searching for? What are the competing books out there? And then, yeah, you write the outline. So uh, what are the major chapters? And then each publisher wants something a little bit different for the outline. Um, some publishers just want a few sentences. Some of them want bullet points. Uh, some want actual, um, like, numbered headings within that chapter, right? Um, and, and so you, you kind of work with that. And you send it back to the publisher. And they will typically send you back some questions. It's often technical questions where they don't understand something that, that you um, that you know a little bit better than they do, or maybe they're looking into the competition and saying, "Well, we do a little bit better for SEO if we can include a chapter on, uh, let's say, solid or design principles or whatever it is." Right? Um, you kind of have a back and forth with them. That's that's really helped. Yeah. Um, I've I've also had conversations with publishers who just said, "Hey, this outline looks great. Let's move on to contract." And, uh, <laughs> That that wound up being a contract I moved away from uh, because it was it was it was a little alarming. Um, so you know it, it's good to get a little bit of pushback if you're just trying to make a better book, uh, and that's their job as an acquisition. Usually they'll have an idea of what they want. Are publishers or the acquisitions folks are they normally technical or just is it like a recruiter technical where they know a couple of the buzzwords or do they have a more intimate technical knowledge like you can't just pass them. BS and hope that they sign off on it. So uh, I'm not sure I can definitively answer that question. I, th I think it's going to depend on who you're talking to, right? Um, some publishers I've encountered have been former you know, technologists who are doing technical writing and are now in publishing. Some people, you know, it might be more of that you know, recruiter route that you're talking about, maybe outside of the technical field coming in. Uh, but once you stay in publishing, you are typically specializing in an area. Like you might be the big data um, acquisitions editor at your at your organization, the .NET guy or gal, um, whatever it might be. And so, even if you didn't start out being that way, uh, you're going to get better at that eventually. I kind of view these folks as SEO minded researchers, um, and so I threw a, a number of things that I knew that they wouldn't have encountered before um, for. Refactoring the C sharp. Uh, for example, I, I talk about scientists.net. I've, I've never seen that in a book before. Uh, Roslyn analyzers, um, GitHub Copilot chat. I actually mm -hmm. had to wait before I sent my outline to the publisher so I wasn't breaking my NDA with Microsoft uh, until Microsoft unveiled that product, right? Or GitHub did, right? Um, so <laughs> uh, that was that was interesting. So yeah, they will look at that stuff and they'll they'll uh, do some research and ask me questions about it. Awesome. So I kind of want to move forward kind of quickly. So assuming you get the outline approved, you spend a couple months writing the book, you go through a couple of series of tech reviews. I, I think we've kind of heard uh, that story a couple of times. So let's not dwell on that. Um, you get paid millions of dollars. I mean, we just gloss over that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That checks in the mail, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, eventually he'll be there. Um, I really am fascinated to talk to you about your next book and because mm -hmm. you're taking what seems like a, a different approach to that where so the recap of you're approached by a publisher that writes your first book but you have a, a new book and i need to stop talking tell us a little bit about the new book and the approach that you're taking with it instead oh well uh kevin i'm, I'm kind of this guy who likes to teach and what i found when i finished my first draft is I didn't, you know, I, I was I allowed myself to play a little bit of Starfield. I had been waiting until I finished the first draft to play some Starfield. I played an hour of Starfield and went upstairs to start winding down for bed. And I couldn't help myself. I started outlining another book. Um, and uh, it's in Starfield. Yeah, I, I still haven't played much of Starfield. It's a um, 70 hour game. Play some Starfield. I, I likely will over the coming month. I started outlining this idea, like if I could, if I could share something more with, I've, I've shared about my past with .NET development. I could share about the things that I care about and passionate about with AI uh, and AI on .NET and um, Azure Stacks and things like that. You know, what would that book like would look like? And, and so then I started uh, approaching a few publishers. I'm like, well, I really liked working with Pact. I'm curious what the process looks like in another place because I'm always looking to learn from people. Um, and then, so I started talking to a bunch of people and seeing how each publisher did their processes a little bit differently. 
Um, and when you approach somebody with an idea, it's a little bit different than approaching you because you now need to sell an acquisitions editor on selling one of their, uh, on, on using one of their, their book slots on your idea and that it's going to garner the interest in sales that they want it to. Um, so it's a little bit more of the um, education side of things. And often they'll counter with, a, oh, that's interesting. I'm not so sure that's, that's us. You know, how are you at you know, X? Uh, would you be interested in uh, revising a book on Y? You know, that kind of thing. Uh, and so they're saying, well, I'm not sure that's, that's my need. I have this other need. You clearly want to write. Would you like to write this? Um, and sometimes you'll send an eight-page proposal or a book to somebody and get back and uh, no thanks and that's it. Um, that can be frustrating too, but, uh, um, so it can be a little bit of a back and forth. Um, it, it becomes evident often when you're, you know, not hitting close to the things that they care about. And that's okay. That's just part of the process. Um, when I actually just got a, uh, an email this morning when I, when I woke up saying like, Hey, we want to move forward with this. Um, uh, here's a couple more steps we need to do before we can start talking contract. But, um, it, it looks like I'll be ready again in the new year and I'm excited about that. That's exciting. How many publishers have you sent the proposal to? I think I've talked to about four four publishers. I think I've really only talked seriously to to about three uh, publishers. Um, two of those were about kind of related projects. I gave them like, hey, here's a couple things I'm thinking about. Uh, maybe they gravitated towards one or the other, or they pushed me towards something to complement they were what they were already working on. But, you know, was within my bounds. Um, there was one that uh, I think would have been a really interesting possibility, uh, but they were kind of pushing me towards an audience that I wasn't ready to write for, uh, just with my level of experience and knowledge. And I, I didn't think we were going to get good, good results. So I walked away from that one. Um, another one said yes, but the terms looked a little uh, uh, not worthwhile, we'll say. That's it. So it, you're passionate about the idea, but you don't want to you don't want to go broke doing it. Like you need to, to get something out of it in the end. Well, it, it's, it's, it's also, you know, it's, it's good to have the, the revenue. It's good to have the recurring revenue. Mm -hmm. um, I get a lot of monthly recurring revenue from uh, actually from medium, from their partner uh, program, from old blog posts a lot. So the more things you can publish in a month, the more of that recurring revenue you're going to get over time, even if it's just a trickle. Um, that's, that's helpful. Um, but it also generates leads too, like the book I got to do with Pact, um, Refactoring with C Sharp. I got that opportunity because I had been blogging and they found me through yeah. that. Um, but when, when you're talking to a publisher, you know, make sure you're getting some sort of an advance. Um, do your research around the rates and the percentages that they're giving. Uh, if it looks like they're finding ways to try to not pay you for things, um, particularly when bundling your, your, your stuff together or whatever. You know, talk to some other authors uh, through that publisher or through other publishers. Uh, you know, you, you're you're allowed to do these things to to kind of defend yourself. Yeah, I think that's some good advice. Talk to talk to other authors. Um, I've also heard advice, and I don't know if this is still relevant today, but my understanding is that there are book agents specific for tech books who would do a lot of this work on your behalf. Um, I don't know if you had any experience with that or you heard about any or might potentially want to try to use one in the future. Now, that's not an area I've, I've looked into too much. Um, I think I, I uh, talked to someone at uh, CodeMash a year or two ago on the book front, uh, but that's not something I, I'd gone on, down too much. Uh, to be honest, the, the reason I wrote Refactoring with C Sharp was because I wanted to keep investing in my students asked after they yeah. graduated because I could, I could teach them the basics of C sharp, but I knew that, you know, I'd been teaching the last three years and now those, those junior devs were getting ready to be mid-level developers. And, uh, you know, this, the book was a, a way of continuing to teach them and other people like them down the, down the road. And, uh, I wound up, uh, leaving teaching and getting into consulting not too long after that. So for me, it's been a way to continue to teach. Yeah. Or get back into the field. So comparing the experience of being pitched the first book and then the second experience of you pitching the book, which one gave you the best deal um, without naming numbers or anything like that? Well, I don't have numbers on the second one yet. 
Okay. Um, yeah. But I, I can tell you it was a lot easier to go to the first round because the second yeah. round, you know, I had to, uh, to sell someone on a, there's no book that exists for this yet. This is a market that I think that we should investigate together. Um, and the publisher's interested in being first, but they're also not interested in, you know, not having any buyers. So, uh, you got to work with them on the risk a little bit there. You have to imagine, is it going to be the type of book that ends up on a shelf or is it only going to be online? Um, I, I think folks looking, I know looking in, uh, publishing a book's expensive <laughs> because people aren't going to bookstores like they were years ago. Uh, I don't think people are even buying books on Amazon at the rate that they were say 15, 20 years ago. Like I remember my pride and joy when I got my first office, um, as a junior dev was my bookshelf. Like every tech book I could get my hands on just went prominently on my bookshelf. So They're, if someone walked the in, the red and like, blue Microsoft ones. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, look at all the books I have. This is all the things I could potentially know if I actually read the books. Um, I ended up reading a quarter of them, but I had them on my shelf because they, they looked nice. Um, it was also when, I mean, at the time, having a good reference book in front of you is, and it's still like a great tool. I love having good reference books in front of me. I do tech reviews for, uh, for different publishers. Now I don't do the, I'm not a tech editor. I do the review afterwards. I always mm. tell the publisher, I'm like, you're not sending me an ebook. Like, if you send me an ebook, I'm probably not going to read it because I do so much better with the physical books. Um, yep. I, yeah, I, I was there last summer and they sent me uh, a nice uh, copy of a machine learning book on Azure. I gave it very high remarks, but they're like, Hey, yeah. is your review done? I'm like, well, the book hasn't derived yet. <laughs> it's just, yeah. Uh, It'd be a great book. Tell me when it, when you can send it and I'll do yeah. a review. Um, but uh, I think it's important to t say that the cost for publishers publishers is decreased um, versus what it used to be because right. most of these things are print on demand now. Um, when you buy a book on Amazon, they are printing it and shipping it from, from there. So it did not exist prior to you clicking buy. Um, and that's different than what it was 20 years ago. Um, it also makes it easier to get into the, the business as a self-publisher too. Uh, so if you want to, to write something, um, with maybe a, a smaller market, uh, and, and, uh, go through the, the, the process of figuring out the layout and, uh, uh, getting it correct and, uh, uh, and all that stuff, uh, you can put it out there on Amazon KDP and it'll be print on demand and, uh, you'll get a lot larger share of the royalties, but you're doing a lot more of the work yourself and, uh, you know, might not be as discoverable as if you were. Was that a plan B for your book idea? If a publisher wasn't willing to pick it up? Kevin, it actually still is a plan B, uh, <laughs> because they haven't sent me the contract yet. Uh, and so. I'm like, I know I have this book I want, I, I want to write. I know I have this knowledge I want to share. I care too much about it to not do it. So let's not let a publisher, you know, hold a metaphorical weapon to my head here. Um, mm -hmm. Let's skill up and do that by writing a small self-published book. And so I, I've been writing a small book on um, computer vision on Azure that featuring the new V4 APIs, they just uh, moved out of preview. I don't think that a whole lot of people are going to be terribly interested in this book, but it's been good for me to get into, here's how I write a book. Here's how I do it in Markdown. Here's how I work with the uh, lean pub, by the way, lean pub, if you're doing self publish, uh, just you're committing uh, files, you push it up to your GitHub repository and it auto generates a, um, a, a preview for you in PDF and it's, it's great. Um, and then you can push that sucker out to, to Amazon and, and, and sell it to folks as an ebook and a print book, print on demand book and great. Um, but I've been working on those skills as well. And if things fall through the publisher I'm, I'm talking with, um, you know, I might find myself going with a larger book, uh, uh, that way. I, I, I think you could do get a lot from having outside eyes on something and having, you know, outside project management, even if you don't necessarily need that, you know, being able to send an email saying, Hey, here's what I got done this week. Um, accountability it's, helps a ton. It's like you're in high school or, or I'm sorry, not high school, but like college. Like, Oh, I have a paper due tomorrow. 
I have to write 500 words on computer vision and I I've only written two. So now you have to stay up all night and you have to write your 500 words. Let, so let me guess. The, fir the first word was computer. The second word, word was vision. Vision. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, and now like chat GPT will just fill in the rest. For <laughs> Actually, as an educator, that's what, what made me start looking at transformers before chat GPT was a thing was, yeah. you know, we started seeing more and more people cheat at college level uh, on these things using, you know, GPT three. And it's okay. This is, this is going somewhere. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's funny you mentioned the college thing because I'm actually am a college student. I'm getting my master's uh, next summer. So, Well, congratulations. That's a ton of work. Uh, yeah. Is it in AI or is it? Uh, data, uh, data analytics. That's a, a good degree to have nowadays. Yeah. Um, I would tell everyone I got a computer science degree and I should have got my degree in business and ah. uh, systems analysis and design. Um, that would have been a far better information system. That would have been a better uh, degree for me to get. Yeah, I got I got computer information systems. Yeah, it, it's not as good when you're trying to go back for a master's. I can tell you that. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, because I'm like, yeah, I've been I've been um, doing this stuff for you know ten fifteen years. Uh, I'm under consideration for Microsoft MVP. I now have that, but you know when I was applying, you know, I, yeah. I, I, uh, they're like, yeah, no, we want to make sure that you pass this one class back in college, you know, fifteen years ago, and yeah, you know, come on, man. I'm fascinated with the self-publishing. I have self-published the book on Amazon with KDP. And I I feel like it's this secret tool that no one talks about that anyone can publish now on Amazon. And the tools are really good. And you just like you said, you just upload a PDF and they'll even send you a sample of your book with watermarks and all that good stuff in two or three days I, That's crazy. Say, I want a sample of my book and next day you uh you get your book and you're like oh this is great so you can do your own tech editing and and send the revisions um i i almost feel like more people should do that just as have something on amazon like the crazy thing about amazon is people will buy any almost any random thing they find on amazon we were selling copies of the book and we didn't even know where the customers were coming from. We were just selling the book yeah. and you get this, uh, we call it stranger money. So it was, you're just getting stranger money from people you don't know who are buying your thing. Um, but I, I love the tip about lean pub cause I always forget about lean pub and it's definitely a great resource. Uh, they're, they're fantastic and they're getting better all the time. They're doing a lot, a lot of interesting things with AI services as well right now. So, you know, if you wanted to, you could use them to translate your book uh, using AI or yeah. uh, AI edit your book or whatever it might be, right? So let's move on from the book. So we are going to keep our fingers crossed that your publisher comes through and you get the deal because I, I guess if we kind of weigh the, the pros and cons of the publisher versus self-publishing, um, I would say a big pro for the publisher is they do some marketing for you. <laughs> like just being in their marketplace helps a ton. Uh, versus you having to go out and say, hi, I'm Matt. I wrote a book. Here's a link. And the, like the worst part about having a good number of Twitter followers or X followers, whatever you call them is asking those followers to go buy something you put out because all of a sudden it doesn't matter how many thousands of followers you have. Like one person might <laughs> You go, man, what's the point of having 3,000 Twitter followers if no one's going to buy my stuff? Matt, let's move on. I want to talk a little bit about the blogging stuff because you, you just kind of said it as a passing comment that you're making money from Medium. Mm -hmm. And I actually want to talk about that a little bit more. So let's just talk about how you got into blogging. Obviously, you are you love teaching. I love teaching too. So we're we're talking the same language. Um, I haven't done too much on medium, so I want to talk about medium and how you're making money off medium, because I think you're the first person I've met who says they've been making money off medium. So I started blogging, um, because I was freaking out over imposter syndrome, believe it or not. Um, I had submitted my first conference, uh, abstract, uh, 
Uh, and I was like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, why would they, uh, why would they select me? You know, there's nothing out there that says I know anything at all about technical debt. And so, oh crap, uh, what I'm going to do is, is during the CFP and during the, during the review process for my session, uh, I'm just going to write a blog post every day or every other day or something like that on, you know, an aspect of testing or technical debt or whatever. Uh, and I, I took that nervous energy from, uh, from my imposter syndrome and I fueled it into, you know, all these little blog posts for really a, 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 about six weeks. I was doing a, a post every day or every other day, something like that. It was pretty, you know, high output uh, yeah. for that period of time. And I, I needed to lay down after that. But I came out of that. I'm like, oh, you know what? I just did six weeks of writing. Um, I liked it. Um, I started writing on Medium. And then a friend in the developer community said, Matt, you ought to check out this Dev2 site. That's dev.to, dev together. Mm -hmm. um, and so my stuff on Medium was going nowhere. Nobody was caring about it. And then I started posting it on Dev2. And I started getting comments from all, all sorts of folks who I know in the community. I really met a lot of them through my, my articles. That was kind of fun. Um, and then I started writing on my own blog and then cross posting to dev to and to medium. And I think my medium stuff started to take off, uh, after a while, you know, they had these internal people that were just kind of looking at stuff and say, Hey, this is high quality enough. Let's promote it more to our official channels. And once that happens, then a lot of people start finding it and a lot of people start reading your stuff. And once enough of that happens, you get this kind of virtuous cycle where, hey, you're now getting enough viewership every month that we are inviting you into the, the partner program. Um, and so you, you actually get a little bit of mon uh, money uh, each month uh, from that. I think they changed it over the summer where you have to be a member of Medium yourself to get paid. Um, and they, they changed the formula a little bit. So I, I think I'm making like 20 bucks less a month than I, uh, than I used to. Uh, but that's okay. Most of my energy right now is going into larger projects like books. But little coming time again where I'm doing a lot more on my my individual blogs like a blog for data science a blog for software engineering yeah so you said you just wrote basically daily or every other day for six weeks you essentially wrote a book because I, I did yeah a little enough writing um so uh so you say you make a little bit of money from medium and I I never try to ask numbers but are we talking like happy meal or filet mignon uh, no, we're, 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 we're talking. So it was, it was 50 month. Um, okay. and, and, and now it's down to about 30 month. That's okay. I'm, I'm happy with that. But again, it's, it's stranger money. It's, yeah. it's money you weren't expecting that just magically shows up. Uh. And, and it's not just that because every so often, you know, you'll roll a 20 on your die and mm -hmm. somebody will say, Hey man, I found this article. Would you be really willing to do a guest post for us? Or would you be willing to have me on your blog? And that's usually a scam. But you know, sometimes yeah. it's 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 an organization like, hey, uh, we write tools related to this thing that you're blogging about. Would you write a post for us uh in exchange for money and or perpetual software licenses? Um it, it, and often it's it's something that I might have wanted to use anyway. So yeah. that's that's, yeah, that's a reason. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um so, you know, this, the stuff tends to pay off in terms of, um, like little financial income, uh, but it also can pay off in terms of these, these one-off opportunities with, you know, established organizations, or maybe recurring opportunities. With those organizations. And then that stuff gets you to have a reputation in this area and that can open up, you know, promotions, it can open up jobs, it can open up all sorts of stuff. So it's not just the. The financial income is the yeah. possibility and the safety net that all this stuff offers as well. It's, uh, it's insurance. <laughs> it's insurance against a future where, um, you know, if you need, if you ever need to find something, you go out and test the network, like, Hey, I'm looking for an opportunity, um, mm -hmm. or I'm looking for my next opportunity. And you if you have enough stuff out there enough people know who you are and they know what you're capable of because you've been just publishing it all over the place it's very easy just <clears throat> you, it's not as easy as being the uh ex ceo of open ai but like where you're hired by microsoft for your full benefits within 24 hours well um, who, who, know, who knows if that actually happened by the time that this that this comes out 
We'll see. Yeah, it's it's a different story every day, isn't it? It, it um, is. But it's nice having your name out there and people knowing who you are. And I think your your job seeking, your opportunity seeking, your um uh what's the term? Your surface level, your luck surface level is broader when you're actively putting yourself out there. Um, and, and I can I can attest to that this year as well. You know, I I came to a point this year where I said I need a new home. I need a new uh, home for what, I, for what I'm doing. I, I'm not okay with me staying on w- with this organization. Yeah. Um, and so I reached out to some some folks I was close to. I'm like, hey, I th- I'm thinking about consulting. Um, what do you think about the place you're at? What do you think about this place? Would you be willing to introduce me? And uh, you know, uh, I, I had you know actually some places say, hey, we we don't even want to technically interview you. If we have a spot for you, you're hired. Um, and that, that, that about blew my mind, right? Uh, because my body of work was my technical interview. Yeah. Um, That's that, that was pretty cool. Yeah. Um, but the act of creating something, the act of lear- researching something to create something will make you better at the stuff that you're already doing too. I think that there's a lot of benefits to that in terms of job retention, in terms of promotion, in terms of salary. Um, so there's, there's a lot of subtle stuff and there's a lot of, the more overt stuff yeah. that this, that these habits can, can help you with. Matt, is there anything you started working on that you just had to ever pull the plug on? It just wasn't working out the way you wanted it to. Well, I, I've hit pause on things before and it's usually stuff that I don't have an external commitment to. Um, right now I'm really not doing a whole lot of uh, things on my blogs. I'm really not doing much with my YouTube channel. Um, and depending on what my, my conversation with this publisher goes, uh, you know, I, I might be, you know, uh, taking some of the logs out of the fire on the self-published book on computer vision. I'm still going to be doing a lot with computer vision because I have a commitment with, uh, with LinkedIn learning on that, which I'm very excited about. But, uh, you, you know, you tend to put that energy where it's being rewarded. Um, and I think that can be an advantage of having multiple channels as well. Because not everything is going to be operating at full steam all the time. Excellent. So I think you kind of dropped the lead there. You're working on a LinkedIn course as well? Yeah, I am uh, working on a, a course with LinkedIn Learning uh, for part of their AI engineer certification, uh, Microsoft Azure AI engineer, AI 102. Um, I'm going to be doing the computer vision cor- portion of that course um, coming out maybe Q2 in the new year. Oh, awesome. I'm, I'm excited about that stuff. Well, is that all? Is there anything else you're currently working on or about to start work on? Oh, I've been doing a lot of uh, hobby work recently on semantic kernel and building uh, AIs. Uh, I'll be giving a talk on that at uh, Global AI Conference in early December and then a workshop at uh, Code Mashup in Sandusky in early January. Uh, tickets are still available for that. And I think uh, actually you'll be able to catch both uh, Kevin and, and I uh, at Code Mash. So I'll be good. Well, the as long as they don't schedule us next to each other, because if they schedule us next to each other, there's going to be no one in my talk. So let's, let's not hope for that. Um, but yeah, we'll both be at code mash. So, yeah. and, I, and I've seen you pack a room before at code. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, luck service level. It's, <laughs> it's every now and then. Um, so Matt, if someone's out there and they're, they're thinking about self publishing their own book, uh, they want to, then when go in books in general, um, do you have any good advice for them getting started? Well, I think uh, your first step is probably going to be to take a look, a look at lean pub. They have some really good resources on getting started. Uh, it's it, they have various tiers available, uh, for how, you know, what your financial commitment might be. Um, you pretty much need pro if you're going to be taking advantage of like the CICD to check in, uh, uh, mark down and generate a PDF. Uh, but that's a very affordable monthly rate as well. Uh, if you're curious about this stuff, if you're just wanting advice, mentorship, whatever, um, you know, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. Just make sure you send a message as your sending connection request. Um, or, you know, you, you can find me on uh, Twitter or whatever we're calling it nowadays. Um, or you can find me at mattylin.dev. That's E-L-A-N-D. And uh, maybe I can convince Matt to join the multi-thread income discord which would also be a great place to discuss this. Um, (laughs) 
Sorry, I got to slip in my own promotion there. No, that's um, fine. But excellent. I think uh, I need to actually go take a look at LeanPub. I remember they were publishing a bunch of stuff when the AI ramp was starting. <laughs> and I was going to take a look at it and never, never came back. So I think that's a great resource. I actually just bought a lifetime license to them uh, last month. So should have waited. And there's probably a Black Friday sale coming. Black Friday, you, you you mean you mean release date for refactoring with C sharp? Exactly. Yeah. The work um, was nice enough to give me that day off. It was nice. So you get to go celebrate even better. Yeah. Matt, it's been a pleasure chatting with you. Is there I mean, we've talked about everything you're promoting. Is there anything else to promote that we haven't covered already? If you or your organization are in need of consulting services, you know, talk to Leading Edge. We're really smart geeks and uh we like to help people out and uh I'd be happy to connect you. Absolutely. All right, Matt, thank you so much for hanging out with us today. And thank you, everyone listening and tuning in. We'll see you all next week on the Multi-Threaded Income Podcast. Thanks for listening to the Multi-Threaded Income Podcast. I've been your host, Kevin Griffin. Please reach out to us on social media at MT Income, wherever you get your socials from. And feel free to join one of our upcoming challenges at multithreadedincome.com. We'll see you next time.